our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous I'm a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Welcome, everybody. Sorry for the couple minute delay here. We are uh, in a new, a brand new system that uh, First Lady of Love has set up. Spent the last three hours just absolutely uh, killing it. But uh, towards the end, we had little glitches here and there, and now we're all good. So I'm hoping everybody hears me. Let me look at the restream just to make sure that's okay. Uh, if there's an issue, an echo, or I'm low, or whatever, you just put it on the stream. I'll pick it up there. And it looks like you're applauding, Susan. They're applauding your good work. So she has her own mic today, too, even Yay. though she's... Oh, I, I have can't my own mic there today. And she also now has the the hoarseness from last week. For me, is essentially resolved. Now, my lovely yeah, wife has it. Yeah, thank you for giving it. And you gave it to the other two kids. And everybody in the house has it, too. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, uh, Tanya, you live too. So uh, here we are. Uh, we're we're coming today from New York City. We have a very interesting guest. We're going to get right to it. We could not uh, do the. We cannot quite pull off the clubhouse connection with this system we have, though we should be able to soon enough. Just we thought too too many, too many things could go wrong if we if we did that. So. Let me introduce the guest. It is Hamilton Morris. He's an American journalist, documentarian, a scientist. He is creator and director of the Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia looking at the chemistry, history, and culture of psychoactive substances. Uh, let me please welcome Hamilton to the show. Hamilton, welcome. Thank you for having me, Dr. Drew. I've uh, been listening since I was a child. That's, uh, I'm not so sure you should have been listening, but I I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> I'll, I'll address it with your parents at a future date. <laughs> but uh, thank you for that. Uh, I, I am very interested in this topic. Uh, I think anybody that knows me knows that I've been looking at this for a while. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, interview Rick Doblin and get to know him a little bit. And, I, and I've seen what MAPS has been up to. Why, why don't we, there's so many different directions we could go. Um, why don't you first address what got you interested in this uh, topic and, and a little bit about your scientific training which I've read about, but I'm going to give you a chance to, to tell everybody. And then I'd be interested to know what you think about the, the research that has been going on so far with organizations like MAPS. Yeah, I've always found it fascinating. Even since I was a young, I remember watching news reports of people overdosing on drugs and thinking that amazing about the possibility that such a thing could even happen, not just you know the tragedy or the superficial elements, but the very fact that combining alcohol and a sleeping pill could result in death, almost like a, you know, the touch of death in a karate movie or something. The very idea that they had such <laughs> power with me. And I remember telling other children about it on the playground in kindergarten because I thought it was just amazing that such a thing could even happen. And that fascination has existed throughout my life. Um, I then went on to study the subject and started working in a lab synthesizing various psychoactive drugs and also traveled around the world visiting different cultures to learn about how they interact with psychoactive substances so i've had this interdisciplinary understanding of the subject and i think it's been a really valuable thing to study. yeah there's there's no doubt that uh humans and mammals and our relationship with uh with um I don't want to say necessarily just strictly conscious altering, but altering substances uh, exist throughout the mammalian kingdom. Uh, mammals do that. that we, we alter our, ourselves. There's, there's a tendency to sort of go back to the bush that gives us a strange uh, kick of one type or another. At least, pr particularly, you know, this is a whole other topic, but there are genetic subsets of different mammals where they're more prone to do that, and they're more prone to go back even, even more frequently. But that, that's a... You know, the whole concept of you know repetitive use. the The issue I want to get into today is more the the potential therapeutic use for hallucinogens, the sort of misguided laws we've had around these things forever, 
and the the history uh, uh maybe we should start with the history uh and i want you to answer that maps question too but but the, the history of hallucinogens i mean some people say that the bhagavad gita was written under the influence of a substance and certainly uh there's lots of uh, perhaps apocryphal stories about alice in wonderland having been written under these sorts of influences um a, I'm going to ask you first, what do you think about the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies? And B, address that history a little bit. Well, I guess I could even start with the history. And there are many histories. There's not one single history of psychedelics or psychoactive drugs. You know, if you go into the archaeological history, there is evidence dating back thousands of years for use of some type. The specifics of exactly what was happening and why people were using these things is a bit speculative. You know, there are uh, peyote effigies that have been found close to the Rio Grande River that date back thousands of years. The same is true of various pipes and snuff apparatuses that are used for the consumption of psychedelic tryptamines in South America. So there's no question that in some cultures, people have been using psychedelics for thousands of years. But there's also all sorts of speculative histories like the Sigveda or the Kaikion of the Eleusinian Mysteries. And in those instances, I think it becomes a little bit more difficult to say exactly what people were doing or why they were doing it, because there isn't that kind of uh, archaeological evidence that can be chemically analyzed to provide some kind of definitive understanding of what exactly was being used, um, although there is an enormous amount of speculation. So, and then of course, you have a 20th century history of R. Gordon Wasson visiting Oaxaca and reporting on the traditional use of psilocybin containing mushrooms and Albert Hoffman discovering LSD in Switzerland and these parallel uh, histories around the world as people started to recognize the power of these substances outside of the indigenous communities that had been using them for thousands of years. And MAPS is an organization that was founded by Rick Doblin, who's a brilliant and wonderful guy. And this largely came as a response to prohibition. Because uh, one thing that's often forgotten about the history of psychedelics is that it's very much a medical history. When you look at LSD and psilocybin, there were immediate efforts to commercialize and medicalize those substances. They were patented. It was all done under uh, the auspices of a pharmaceutical research lab, Sandoz in Switzerland. And it wasn't until the commercial interest in these things started to dry up that prohibition really started to take hold. It was like after there was a, a loss of commercial <laughs> medical interest, then people said, uh, all right, these things are more trouble than they're worth. Let's, uh, let's make them all legal. And of course, it's not that simple. There are all sorts of other motivations that have gone into prohibition in terms of its power to control people in order to uh, use the almost ubiquitous uh, consumption of drugs um, you know, a lot packed into this. But Rick Doblin came in uh, specifically around the time that there was an increased medical interest in MDMA and an interest in prohibiting it. And uh, initially, a lot of these researchers sort of wanted to play nice with the government. They wanted to figure out a system where the government could control it, but scientists could still research it and physicians could still use it as a psychotherapeutic adjunct. But then they just made it schedule one. And Rick Doblin and MAPS came in as a way of combating this prohibition so that people could still use these things as medicines in the future. I, I would also argue that, that what I like about Rick is he's a, he's a careful clinical scientist. He, he's very cautious about claims. He's very cautious about adverse outcomes. I mean, really, when I spoke to him, I talked to him last about, I guess, a year ago. And he had just, he was about, he had a few months away from publishing the MDMA study that came out probably now six months ago on uh, complex, complex PTSD. And at the time he was saying, this is the, really the only thing I can say right now about psychedelics. Don't say anything else. We can't say it yet. He wants to be able to be sure we do the science properly before we make claims. Very important is the um, of public opinion tends to swing toward extremes where something is either responsible for all of society's ills or the cure to those ills. And the problem mm -hmm. is both extremes 
are detrimental to scientific and medical research and to society yep. as a whole. So, you know, if the future of these things is to be better than the past, which I think it will be and hope it be, one important component of that is to be extremely careful about what claims are made and to neither uh, exaggerate nor minimize the benefits they might have. Right, right. I totally agree with you. I, you know, the, the, uh, this opening little sequence of this program, we have a, a, a quote from me back on CNN saying, you know, our drug laws are draconian and bizarre. They're just bizarre. They're truly, they're not based in science. They're not based in anything. They are just wild and, and, and capricious and arbitrary and excessive and bizarre. Um, and, oh, and, and then when nuts. we go it's the other insane. way, it's nuts. And now we've gone the other way where we, we've lost the, the carrot and stick notion that, I, that was so important to get people with opioid addictions into treatment. And the, it just, they're just, they, I don't know. I don't know how to get away from the moralizing and all the nonsense and, and into just what's, you know, human beings have a relationship with a chemical. The chemical's nearly good, neither good nor bad. It's just as that relationship evolves, there's things we can maybe do to help the human condition. And there are things that can go bad and we can help them with that. And that's it. <laughs> that, that's, that's the relationship with substances. Um, but but there, it has been used, or it's currently in, in some settings, been used for other sorts of, uh, I guess we have to put it in the sort of spiritual plane. Um, and I'm not quite sure what to do with that. I, I, I mean, yeah, there, there's areas of, let, let's, let's just get into some areas of concern for mine. Um, for instance, um, you know, people are running down to various countries and getting ayahuasca treatments. And occasionally that really helps somebody, but I don't know how to select the right patient for that. And I don't know what the dosing conditions are. And I don't know what the, the time course of recovery is or what the, whether it wears off. We, we just don't have that kind of data. So I, I, I worry about it though. It, when I see people like people have recalcitrant drug addiction and severe personality disorders, sometimes really respond to this stuff and have not responded to anything else. Maybe you can just comment on that. Yeah, and it goes, again, in both directions. So you have instances where there is uh, what could be called malpractice of one kind or another, abuses, even in one notable instance, a shaman that murdered somebody who had come to their clinic, a teenager <laughs> named Kyle Nolan. Oh and on the other side, you have people that have these miraculous, transformative experiences and one problem is assuming the best, assuming that somebody has an absolutely extraordinary experience that helps them, well, how can that information then be used to help other people when you don't know what the dose of the chemical was, you don't know the exact right. methodology of the therapeutic right. process. And so- uh, right. Whether it will sustain, uh, so, whether it will keep you sustained, or how long it will sustain, that kind of thing. Yeah, so you know, there's issues with monitoring, issues with reproducive results, avoiding negative outcomes. And a lot of this emerged simply because our culture has no framework for doing this. So we've turned to other cultures right, because we, right, the only right. thing you can really say about what we've done is we've done it in the worst way you could possibly imagine. We've tried to right. solve the problem by locking really people in point. cages. And so yeah. almost anything yeah. is better than what we've done. Yeah. It's out of desperation that people run, run to other, other sources. But here's here's my concern for people that want to do it as part of a spiritual process. Some of these medicines, uh, and let's let's mute. I, I don't mind any problem calling them medicines, but sometimes um, when people I I've dealt with lots and lots of patients that have done these things and very, either done them recreationally and things have turned out not so great, or have tried to use things therapeutically in other countries and. I've seen things that worried me, whether it was even therapeutic or not, just a spiritual quest. But, but the, the main thing, that one, one of the first and foremost things that worry me, and I, I'd be interested in just getting your thoughts on how to frame this, is that some, oftentimes, not sometimes, oftentimes, people come back and their personality has literally changed in sort of <laughs> clear but sort of ineffable ways and as part of that change, they're often a little more sort of uh, less negative and more delightful. And people go, look, it's bad. They're better. See, they're, they're a happier person. And there's actually literature from the 60s and 70s documenting these personality changes and then passing judgment on the personality changes as good because the person seemed happier. And here's my problem. We are talking about changing 
who the person is at a fundamental level, their very personality characteristics, that is a profound uh, phenomenology, it is profound to say, oh, I'm going to do... It's one thing to try to open up some neural pathways and put the patient in control in the therapeutic context of the changes that they're going through. It's another to say, I dropped something in and now they're a different person. What do we do with that? Yeah. Well, that's a really interesting point. And I think it also comes down to very precisely how you define personality, because one of the components... Well, maybe, and, and let me interrupt you. I got to interrupt you. I, 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 I think maybe personhood or, or fundamental characteristics of the person, like, like they're just, they're, they're, I mean, I'm sure it can be measured, but, but it's not, I wouldn't barely recognize the person sometimes that comes back. And it's like, okay, yeah, they are smiling more and yeah, they're less negative, but that's not the same dude anymore. And that's because what, it, that's no, when it, I was like, really, whoa. Yeah. It's a really interesting point. And of course, you know, personality, it, one of the defining features of personality is that at least in adulthood, it, it tends to be unchanging. It is who you are. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. there was a, a new research being done at Johns Hopkins, one of the most interesting things that was found is, you know, that psychologists have a five factor model of personality with these different attributes, uh, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. And what they found was that there was an increase in openness. So that would be a change in personality, something that in and of itself is extraordinary in any direction. Uh, this actually right. happened to be one of the findings that came out of Johns Hopkins that was not replicated. So in larger scale studies, they did not find that there was a personality difference. They found that the openness increase that was initially observed was not reproducible. There was not an increase in openness. So in terms of these, the five factor model has not been a, an observed change in human personality for better or worse. But in a looser sense of the word personality, absolutely. There is yeah. you know, a non-clinical definition of the word. There are definitely are changed. That's kind of the, one of the reasons that people pursue these experiences is because uh, for every person out there that will do anything not to change, who's almost addicted to control, people that want to change, they, they're holding on to bitterness or resentment or fears of some kind, and they want to change. And that change in their personality is something that they are seeking this experience explicitly to produce. I get what you're saying. And, and, and if we had a better control over the degrees of change and the and the anticipated changes, I, I just am am I come from the school of thought that the patient's got to be in control of the changes, and when it's a chemical that's in control, like, like I have no problem with people. Um, there's a whole world I'm sure you've gotten into of uh, <coughs> hallucinogenic or plant plant medicine therapeutics, uh, uh, psychotherapy where people are in the hands of a psychotherapist who uses plant medicines. And I've seen some extraordinary things with that, but I still feel like in those cases, the, the patient is in control of the process as opposed to boom, something hits you over the head or gets into your bloodstream or whatever it is. And, and boom, you've changed that. Ugh, I ethically, I just, I can't get my, I can't get my head around that. So I, I I'm cool with people wanting to change. I just want them to be, <laughs> I, I don't know how to how to quite process this piece because it's really bothered me for a long time. Like like I said, the the people that I've seen who were psycho sociopathic, maybe even psychopathic with recalcitrant addiction, who really changed, like massively changed who they are in a very positive way. I got to say, um, that's one thing. <laughs> that's one thing. If somebody's like desperately ill and destroying their life, it's another when. You know, I just want to be a little more open to experiences or whatever it is. It just, oh, I don't know. I, I maybe I'm too old fashioned. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, have you, have you well, talked? I think, go ahead. I mean, I think that it can go both ways because I, I understand what you're saying, of course, but think of a, a normal depressed person. They're prescribed an SSRI and yeah. in some sense, they are under no control whatsoever. The, no one is saying like every day when you take this, think happy thoughts, plan to get happier. The idea is the chemical goes into your central nervous system and it alters serotonin activity and you're just going to get better. Yeah. Whereas when you look at the psychotherapeutic processes that are used both clinically and in traditional indigenous environments, there often is an emphasis on intention and what you want to achieve. If you are, for example, dying of cancer, 
maybe you want to achieve a state of peace where you accept your own mortality so that you can uh, leave the world and your loved ones in a way that they don't suffer knowing that you have suffered. And this is something that has actually yeah, been yeah. observed. And I think that this would actually oh, yeah. be aligned oh, no. with the sorts of changes that somebody would want to achieve as opposed to some kind of, um, you know, random shuffling of the deck of consciousness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's a that's a different thing, which is you know end of life dread, right? This is treatment of end of life dread, a and I am a hundred. If if I had a terminal diagnosis and it was winding down, I think I'm fairly certain I would do this. I would either do psilocybin or LSD. Uh, if it's only it can be done under a protocol, fine, I'll do it under a protocol, whatever. But it, it works, and and I Doblin hinted at me. I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but he I think he kind of hinted that he's kind of looking to that research as the next you know, sort of definable uh, clinical domain for, for therapeutic process. And, you know, I, you've seen it, I've seen it. It works like a son of a bitch. And why should people have end-of-life dread? And who cares what the risks are? Who cares? You're going to die in a few months anyway. So whatever the risks are, are absolutely worth it. So in that situation, if somebody has massive personality changes, no problem. <laughs> Because uh, that person is not going to be there in three months anyway. So good. If the person, if, if suffering is diminished and, and meaning is made of the life process through the use of chemicals, man, that is genius. Uh, and I know palliative care specialists and whatnot are looking forward to being able to do this kind of thing. Have you, have you gone to any of the research centers that are doing this work? I know one of the major researchers in that area, Bill Richards, who's a, a brilliant psychologist, and he was one of the pioneers in the end of life psychotherapy uh -oh. using DPT. Uh, hang on one and, second, everybody. I don't know if I'm still on or not. Caleb, am I still going? Oh, uh, yes, you're still going. We just froze on uh, our guest, froze on me too. So I'm all frozen. Okay, they hear us. There we are. We're all back. Yeah, it was your, your Wi Fi. Seem to have skipped my Wi-Fi. That's yeah. what I figured. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> yeah, our Wi-Fi has been very strange lately. Okay, so so you were saying about uh, the the researcher doing the end of life dread research. Yes, yeah. So there's a, a researcher named Bill Richards um, who is really the expert on this subject. I can't recommend his <laughs> book Sacred Knowledge enough. And there was a 60 Minutes documentary that was made. You can watch it on my YouTube channel. I just uploaded it because it's hard to find. Um, and right. he is administering a drug called DPT to somebody who's dying of cancer. And you see how profound this is for them and for their family to achieve yeah. this sense of peace at the end of their life. Yep. And uh, yep. I remember when I first heard about this therapy, I, I didn't fully get it. I thought, well, wait a second, end of life. Isn't it more important to people who are life? Isn't it more important to treat somebody who's depressed because they might have decades of life no. ahead of them but yeah, it's no. when you when you see this when you see it in the the eyes of the people and their family you realize exactly how important this research is and how much comfort it can provide to people and their families i 100 percent. I, I can't wait for that to become a, a standard of care I, I, and you know how we deal with death in this country is fucked up <laughs> it's just so fucked up you know we just pretend it's not going to happen like we could we're going to fight it we're going to fight it off as opposed to making the process of dying as as dignified and as t potentially in the way you know i'm sure dr richard is making it as as glorious as living itself it should be part of the process and i'm wondering as you look at other cultures if they have uh you know, this, uh, often scriptures or things to help us with that, that they include that in, in things they left behind, these cultures. Yeah, it is not well documented. I've looked into this. I haven't seen uh, strong evidence. I've heard some sort of anecdotal reports of indigenous groups that do use psychedelics in that, uh, in, for that purpose in Oaxaca, but I haven't seen it or haven't really, I'm not sure how common something like that is. Um, in fact, when you look at the indigenous traditions surrounding these things, they can be totally different from what we're doing right now. Um, for example, it's not uncommon when you look at the anthropological literature for people to be using psychedelics to find lost objects. This is something that would, of course, not even exist in our medical system. In addition to um, basically a, a fundamentally religious use of these substances more than anything else. In Gabon, where there's a long tradition of using a psychedelic shrub called iboga, the purpose of iboga is 
a religion called Bwiti. An entire religion is built around the history and consumption of this plant, which they conceptualize as the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's a syncretic religion religion that incorporates Christmas as well. So uh, in the United States, when people talk about Ibogaine, it's almost exclusively in the context of treatment of addiction. But right. in Gabon, right. where there's actually a history of using this, it is only now, only very recently being used for that purpose. Historically, it was exclusively religious and, and, and medical as well, but in a different sense that had nothing to do with addiction, partially because right. there was no opioid use until somewhat recently in right. Central West Africa. Right. And, and, and to be fair, some of the, some of the uh, addictive drive for other substances is diminished by, by uh, things like Ibogaine. But, but let, let's leave the, the clinical topic for a second. Let's go into real speculative territory. Okay, you ready? Uh, so we're both okay. scientists. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, you're, you're, and I'm not going to ask you to speculate about what people should or shouldn't be doing. I'm going to ask you to speculate. We're going to be sort of philosophical for a second. So, so um, you and I, you know, you have extensive chemistry training. I have extensive clinical training. We understand physiology. By, by the way, for, you know, I always give people a lot of crap when they, uh, they tell physiological stories. I just, I said, just write down the chemical equation, the stoichiometry for me first. Just do that first. Let's just start there. No one ever can do that ever, ever in anything, any story they're trying to tell. So I appreciate you're always starting from the chemistry and then building up to the physiology. But, let, but let's build up even further into the metaphysical okay uh we're gonna go we're gonna ex we, we, we let's and let's uh and you if i say anything you disagree with interrupt me so so let's posit that we have these instruments that developed across evolutionary time they are very limited in terms of their what the, what we what we can and can't do uh we don't know what we don't know it's extraordinary that we've been able to use this instrument to do as much as we have been able to most of it is really because of how we interact socially and how we build on each other's uh knowledge base and and how we as you know social teams are able to solve problems but it's it's this is a very limited instrument in terms of perception it's a lot we don't see i just you know it's easy to point at things like infrared or x-rays or gamma rays there's all kinds of things in our environment we don't see including time itself i would i would argue that temporality is something that the human brain does not deal with very well but well, i'll pause it all that is that okay? Am I, am I okay with you so far? Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm on. Okay. Yeah. So what is it about, you know, inhibiting monoamines or opening a synaptic transmission in sort of a kind of a soupy, uncontrolled sort of a way in certain regions of the brain again, and I might, and I'm going to speculate now that a lot of this goes on in the sort of posterior parietal region because we don't know a lot of what's going on there but we knew we do know a lot of self function or sense of self and being uh does sort of sit back there that's all what's destroyed during alzheimer's that's why people lose their beinghood uh that region uh, dr damasio was very pushing me on that topic at one point but what is it we're getting? So when we open up these, the soup and we stir it with a special chemical and the synaptic transmission, are we, are we seeing a reality? Are we distorting the evolutionary purpose of the instrument? Are we, what's your metaphysical sense? I mean, obviously I could ask that question a million ways, but I'll let you, let you struggle with it. Yeah, well, I can say what we're not getting. And one thing that we're not getting is something from the molecule. I think that there is an idea that is sort of an animist or vitalist concept that the drug itself contains information, but you can look at a drug all day. It doesn't contain information. It's an inanimate constellation of carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen and oxygen or whatever else. And so when we introduce these substances into our body, whatever occurs, it is coming from within us. It is something that is generated by our own consciousness, not by the drug. And both you and I could come up with 50 different mechanisms based on research literature on how exactly this is operating, whether it's disruption of the default mode network or glutamate release in cortical pyramidal or cells or whatever, yeah, yeah or yeah, any yeah. number of, you know, anything. So, so, and ultimately that doesn't really have all that much explanatory value. And 
Well, it does right. in, in certain contexts, but from an experiential standpoint, it doesn't have all that much explanatory right. value because if somebody right. says, oh, it's disruption of the default mode network or it's uh, agonism of 5-HT 2A receptors or whatever, what does that really say about experience? So in, in yeah, that it's all sense, true. By the way, that, all true, all accurate, all accurate, and, and maybe one day lead us into a deeper understanding of what's happening, but not right now. Now that's all just sort of epiphenomenon that may or may not have something to do with the experience. Directly. And for that reason, I almost right. think that the stories that we tell and our own qualitative <laughs> assessment of these things is the highest resolution tool that we have for studying these things at this time. There was a, a scientist who I really admire named Alexander Shulgin, and he did an enormous amount of research on chemistry and did an enormous amount of research on his own experience taking the drugs. But he almost felt that mm -hmm. everything in between those two points was so speculative that it didn't... Uh, it didn't, it couldn't be studied satisfactorily scientifically. And one thing that I think is so brilliant oh, about the work that he again. did is, hope, is uh, Caleb, are you still hearing us? Uh -huh. There you are, Drew. That's funny. Okay, here we're back. Somebody was just saying we've disrupted the default mode network. That's really funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you said that, it went out. That's hysterical. So, so, uh, so you, you're, tell us about that, that, that physician. Or, well, he's a chemist. What, what was his role? Yes, yeah, yeah. Alexander Shulgin, brilliant chemist, possibly best known for popularizing MDMA. But at the time that he was doing this research, pharmacological techniques were not as advanced as they are today. And I think that ultimately that was for the best, because if he had been doing pharmacology, all that work would be obsolete and useless. But because he focused mm -hmm. on chemistry, which is timeless, and experience, which is timeless, his work will never be obsolete. And in that sense, I think that our experiences are one of the best ways to characterize it. So you say, what do I think is going on? Well, in some sense, whatever I think is going on is what's going on. And that's what matters. So if somebody in an indigenous culture thinks that there is a spirit escaping from their body and in the escape of that uh, demonic spirit, they have been cleansed and that's why they feel better, then that experience is, the, you know, whatever interpretive framework that best explains what has just occurred. Um, but you know, that, that's a purely psychological phenomenon. That's something that happened, not the brain. When it comes to the brain, there's a disconnect that we haven't bridged in a satisfactory way. And we may never bridge it because you have to go from agonizing 5-HT2A receptors to, uh, right. you know, a sense that you are at peace with your own mortality. It's, it's a hard right. thing to bridge these two extremes. So, so yeah, I agree with you and I'm going to, and we're going to, I'm going to force you to follow me further down this rabbit hole, which is, um, uh, that, um, uh, I had some, a bunch of thoughts that just escaped me and that's, uh, that's my brain since COVID. I don't know about yours, but I, I, I once an hour, I have to announce to my audience that I'll block Keep and, and about, that, honey. what's that? Keep blaming it on that. Well, it's we it, well when it's aging, it doesn't come back. But from from but from COVID, about two minutes later, my thought comes back. So that's what's unusual about it. Uh, but but uh, I am oh yeah, here I am. I know what it was, which is that you know our 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 frontal lobes are and our you know our cognitive systems are always trying to make sense of what's happening to us. I mean that's all they're doing. You know, things happen to us in our bodies and in our regu in our emotional systems, and then our our conscious brain goes, I know what that was. You're you know a leopard escaped from your you know your ear canal, and you feel better now because of that, or whatever. We or we think of we start thinking in psychological terms. We start making sense of things. What whatever it might be, it's us trying to make sense of things that are kind of. Mm, we may not be able to explain and we are certainly aren't in control of i i have a sense uh, and and by the way i by the way i have no problem with people using concepts that are culturally uh meaningful to them to explain their experiences that to me makes perfect sense and as long as they're internally consistent and they're logical i i, I would never take that away from somebody but but i want you and i to go a little in more in the physiological realm or at least in the I, I think I'm going to go metaphysical off physiology, but my sense is, let me just turn over the cards. My sense is that there is in a lot of these experiences, one of the, the one of the common experiences is some sort of um, either awareness of, or a dissolution of some people describe it as ego again, trying to make sense of things, the, the self itself and it's, um, 
and the fact that it's a fabricated, you know, as, as Damasio says, it's a repeatedly reconstructed uh, neurological unit that endows me meaning with subjectivity. <laughs> and that's it. And you sometimes you pull away from it or it dissolves or something. Go ahead. Your, your thoughts. On dissolution of the, the ego. Well, I, you know. Yeah. I, or or, I, or, or seeing you know, it talk- more transparently. Yeah. I mean, one, one thing that has happened uh, somewhat reliably for me that psychedelics can do, and this is one of the hardest selling points when it comes to psychedelics or the hardest things to communicate to people that haven't used them, is that during what I find the most constructive psychedelic experiences, there's often <laughs> a period where I think that I'm going to die. And you tell a mm-hmm. normal person that you took a drug and you thought you were going to die, they think, that sounds terrible. Right. That's something I would like to avoid at all costs. And the reason is because it is terrible. Right. It's extremely, extremely uncomfortable to think that you're going to die, but that is the entire value of this experience. You have a moment where you think, I'm going to die. And in that moment, you confront your own mortality or you confront the reality of your own eventual death and you come out of it feeling stronger and grateful for the life that you still have. But uh, I think that's one, one component of it is that they can through these subtle manipulations have a very strengthening effect. The same applies to the anti-addictive effect of Ibogaine or Iboga, where um, I think when people typically talk about it, they make it seem like it's just, uh, oh, it's, you know, it's a a non-competitive antagonist at alpha-3, beta-4, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors or whatever, and that's what it's doing. But there's also a psychological dimension to it. And at least in my experience, the psychological dimension was a feeling of self-sufficiency because in Gabon, these ceremonies are incredibly grueling mm. physically, incredibly grueling. People go for days without food or water or sleep and just mm. keep dancing. And the entire time you're suffering. And when you're suffering, you want to end the suffering. You're tired. You want to sit down. You're thirsty. You want a drink of water. You're hungry. You want some food. But what I found with the iboga was a sense that, yes, I do want those things. And yes, those things will decrease my suffering but I can do it. I'm okay. I'm not going to die. I'm thirsty, but I can go longer without water. I'm hungry, but I can keep going without food. I'm tired, but I can keep dancing. It's going to be okay. And I think that that sense of internal strength and self-sufficiency is extremely empowering because it gives you the strength to endure suffering. I think this is also why the symbol of Christ on the cross is so powerful to people in so many different cultures because it's a sign of divinity in suffering (laughs) that there is strength to be derived from enduring pain um you know that's of course not like a technically christian reading exactly but it's i think that's one reason that this has such powerful symbolic value and and i i would argue that uh, you're zeroing in on something that we could use a big dose of in this country right now as a matter of fact so that's interesting to me um, back to your experience of I'm dying or I'm going to die. I, I have heard multiple different flavors of that that people experience under these drugs, including I'm, I'm dead, I'm gone, I don't exist. And what exists is the universe and it's okay. A sense of purposeful beingness outside of the self. Did that kind of, th- is, have you heard of that kind of stuff and did that kind of thing happen to you? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, with some of these substances, and they can all be very different in terms of their chemistry and pharmacology, but something like 5-MeO-DMT, what's so interesting about it is the absence of content in the experience, at least for me. So you might take right. something like LSD and have this massive explosion of memories and visions and sensations and impressions and reverberating metaphorical interpretations of your existence. And it's like your consciousness is this you know, giant fractal of ideas. Whereas with something like Mm -hmm. 5-MeO-DMT, it was a complete absence of anything. There was nothing to report. I didn't come out of it with anything to say. I whited out. There was whiteness and a loss of consciousness for about 15 minutes. And yet when I came out of it, I had the same sense of gratitude for life and felt rejuvenated by the process. So So yeah, there's all sorts of strange things. It's It's just a stronger DMT, right? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's more chemically different from DMT than even psilocin from mushrooms. So it's, it's a, you know, it's only the addition of an oxygen and a carbon, but 
it uh, changes the pharmacology and the pharmacokinetics quite a bit. So it's it is like a mm. you know a different substance despite having DMT in its name. Um, you know, DMT is hyper visual, hyper classically psychedelic, whereas 5-MeO DMT for many people, myself included, produces no visual distortions whatsoever. It's almost more like a, an anesthetic or something. You take it, you lose consciousness. And well, you but come back. I, that's what I, I actually wanted to say. It, it, but no one has experiences like that from anesthetics. At anesthetics, you cease to exist and things happen to you and you exist again as though that period of time was cut out. You don't feel better after anesthesia typically, that's for sure. Well, what about ketamine? Uh, so it is different in some. Well, ketamine, ketamine is more of what we call waking you know, or twilight anesthesia. Uh, yeah. And that, you know, waking, you know, general, and when I say anesthesia, I mean general anesthesia where you're, you're out, you're, you're gone. You cease to, you know, cease to exist uh, in, in much the same way you did from the, you know, the methoxy DMT, but, uh, but it's a different experience. It is. Ketamine is another interesting drug. Right? We, we can get into that in a second. I, I tell you what, I got to take a quick break. We have a couple of uh, ads we're going to play here. Um, give us your website again, Hamilton. Well, you can listen to my podcast at patreon.com slash Hamilton Morris or follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Hamilton Morris. Those are the best places to find Great. me. Or if you want to watch my show, it's available on Hulu. When we get back, it, it, talk, to, talk to us about what's really fascinating you now. What, what is most, you know, what are you thinking about? What are you preoccupied about? And uh, we'll go forward from there. Take a little break. Be right back. Sure. I want to give a shout out to our good friends at Blue Mics. If you've heard my voice on this show any time over the past year, including right now, you've been listening to Blue Microphones. And let me tell you, after more than 30 years in broadcasting, I don't think I have ever sounded better. But you don't need to be a pro or have a fancy studio to benefit from a quality mic. You may not realize it, but if you've been working from home or using Zoom to chat with friends, you probably spend a lot of time in front of a microphone. So why not sound your best? Whether you're doing video conferencing, podcasting, recording music, or hosting a talk show, Blue has you covered. From the USB series that plugs right into your computer to XLR professional mics like the mouse or the Blueberry we use in the studio right now. Bottom line, there's a Blue microphone to fit your budget and need. I can't say enough about Blue mics, and once you try one, you will never go back, trust me. To take your audio to the next level, go to drdrew.com slash blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. Anyone who's watched me over the years knows that I'm obsessed with Hydrolyte. In my opinion, the best oral rehydration product on the market. I literally use it every day. My family uses it. When I had COVID, I'm telling you, Hydrolyte contributed to my recovery, kept me hydrated. Now, with things finally reopening back around the country, the potential exposure to the common cold is always around. And like always, Hydrolyte has got your back. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, my new favorite, starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients Plus, each single-serving easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-to-pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water, make a great-tasting drink, has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink, it uses all-natural flavors, gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-E-W. Be sure to use the code Dr. Drew 25 for a special discount. Thankfully, we are supported by products that actually have changed my life. Hydrolyte, as recently as, well, I had this recent illness I had, it bailed me out. Also, the reason we could do this from New York is thankfully a blue mic. This blueberry is my favorite mic by far. What is that That one, the 300? Yeah. The E-Core 300? Um, that's, uh, this is something that Susan is using for her mic. It's an amazing, uh, and I, we tested a ton of mics, and it's just, uh, blue mics just blow everything else away. So thank you to Blue Mic for is helping us Is this thing on? Is this thing on? Yes, it's on, yes. Uh, so you can follow Hamilton Morris at, on Twitter and, and Instagram at Hamilton Morris. Uh, of course, Hamilton Pharmacopia. Will there be a fourth season? Uh, not anytime right now because I am working in a lab. I just do chemistry now. I've uh, spent the last... Man, what are you doing? Maybe, uh, Fantastic. Uh, I'm creating new psychedelics. 
<laughs> so organic chemistry, essentially. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. Medicinal chemistry. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, where, where do you do that? Sciences. Yeah. It's yeah. at uh, the oldest pharmacy school. Yeah. It's the oldest pharmacy school in the country, the University of the Sciences, formerly the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, but they changed the name. And uh, it has been a, a great place. They have a program for research on psychedelic drugs. And one aspect of this recent commercial interest in psychedelics is that there's been an increase in funding. This was an area that traditionally had no funding whatsoever. I mean, if you wanted to research on psychedelics, you had to find a philanthropist who would give you money, or you had to do something like what Rick, Dob Rick Doblin has admirably done, where he uh, has been able to get funding from various groups, but extremely difficult. And one reason is that people didn't want to fund this work. Or if you were doing the work, it had to be done under the context of some kind of uh, research on their toxicity or something like that. So it's been a, a great time to actually start doing basic scientific research. This is just, you know, pure chemistry and um, Incredible. creating a lot of new compounds. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. I mean, who knows what you guys will discover that. F thank God. Finally, you know, rationality prevails where you can move science forward without a moral blanket uh, putting it out completely. Yeah. I, and I hope that, you know, it's of course one of the great ironies of the <laughs> liberalization of cannabis law in the country was. Uh oh, I lost, I've lost Hamilton's audio. Hamilton, I don't know if you hear me, maybe did you hit a mute button or something? Is it? No, because we're not frozen. We're still, we're still here. No, Drew, you're still second. there. He must have hit a mute button by accident. Oops. It sounds, it looked like he hit a mute button because it just, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, Hamilton, but I think you hit mute somehow or, or pulled your cord out or something. Um, so give you a chance to set up here and you can pick up, no, don't have you yet. I mean, you can pick up where we left off about the liberalization of weed laws. You're about to say something interesting. He's still there and connected. Yeah. I see him. Uh, let me look at the restream, see what you guys are doing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. D yes, the DEA has disconnected us. Uh, <laughs> people are saying that uh, Hamilton, your series is the best one on Vice, which I think is probably smart. Uh, Mind Bloom. Let's see. Uh -huh. um, what is Hamilton's angle? Angry Bear... I don't know what you're talking about. He is interested in the, the, this particular relationship with chemicals that humans have. Uh, let's see what else you guys are saying here. You guys have any other questions on Restream while we try to get Hamilton hooked back in again? Maybe you can... Uh... Yeah, Joe Rogan should be here. That's really funny. Uh... Okay, I'm looking at all your guys' comments. Thank you, David. Uh... I'm looking at your, now I'm looking in real time at your guys' restream, if there's any questions, any, anybody have any confusion about COVID? I'm certain lots of people have a lot of weird confusion these days, because it's, uh, the press is almost, almost intentionally trying to make it uh, as, as they're, they're trying to stay with the panic, and because they can't, they're getting desperate, and they're using confusion instead of panic techniques. Uh, so, it's interesting. Uh, he, he, yes, I'm sure he is looking at N NMDA uh, and antidepressant properties. I, I'm certain of that, or, or even glutamate pathways. That's a very common area of research. We can ask him that when he gets back. Uh, studying the health impact of long-term microdosing. Yeah, we didn't really talked about this yet, but I, I personally have seen so much bad outcome from exposure to over, over particularly over time to hallucinogenic strong ones like LSD. I, it is no way it could be a good thing long term. It, it is, um, it's just, it just doesn't fit my clinical experience at all. So I'm very what, concerned about people doing that. Ha Hamilton, I hear him. I hear yeah, Hamilton, yeah. you back. Okay, all right. Refreshing. See, why old fashioned see, people refreshing are the window. The virus. Uh, Dawson, I assure you, I'm seeing both vaccinated and unvaccinated. And the vaccinated, vaccinated are doing much, much, much better. Trust me, much. Uh, in fact, the Omicron has been an almost a nothing. Um, uh, let's see, staff, public in hospitals being overloaded and staff not being available. Um, yes, when people say hospitals are filling up, they're, they're, what they're saying is that they can't get the staff. Nobody is overloaded. 
the there's an uncoupling now between the incidence of illness and hospitalizations. Hospitalization is maybe ticking a little bit, cases way up. And if you're an old person and you get something like a virus, it can kill you. That's just the way it is. Any virus can do that to you. So we're going to be left with that kind of risk, of course, for older folk. Um, but we will begin to treat them with geriatric care as we have always done with uh, viral illnesses in the in the advanced age. Uh, but do not think for a second that the hospital. Yeah, uh, in fact, in, I'll just get him back and say. In fact, uh, Fauci just was in an interview where he was saying that even the pediatric reports are false. That's this is Fauci's words. He is saying that what's being reported is children being admitted with COVID, not because of COVID. So the, even the hospitalization in the pediatric group, which is a concern, um, is not going up according to Dr. Fauci. So Hamilton, the weed laws, how did that change things? Yes. Oh, no, I was just saying that there's a, an unfortunate irony in this commercialization of cannabis where you have people becoming millionaires at the same time that there are other people who are still in prison for cannabis right. crimes. And I would hope that Crazy. something analogous does not happen with psychedelics. I hope that this increased pharmaceutical and commercial interest will be coupled with strong efforts for decriminalization to prevent all of the damage that's done by people going to prison for possession yeah. of yeah. psychedelics or you. using Again. these things. Draconian yeah. and bizarre, draconian and bizarre. I mean, just bizarre yeah. how we have treated, how the law and the moralizing has has uh, come down on these things. I, I think it's, what, what people don't understand is it's primarily because people on drugs and alcohol, a lot, a lot of them over time will do awful things. <laughs> That's not because the drugs are bad. That's not because the people are bad. That's part of a specific condition that people get into where they can't stop and need help with that. But let's go back. Uh, let's see. We were heading down a, a, a path. Where were we going? We were talking about your research. We were talking about what you're up to now and what it is that you're preoccupied with. And what's, is, it, is it the your research in the lab that's, that's you're excited about now? Or are there other things that you're looking into that uh, you hope to get into deeper in the future or that preoccupy you? Yeah, it's right now it is the lab work because... I've been working in this lab for 12 years, and for the vast majority of that time, there has been no support for the research. And I used to always think, wow. And I was also, on top of that, doing it as a part-time thing on the weekends. I was primarily making a documentary series, but then I would go and do chemistry uh, when I had time to do it. And I would always think, if I could do this much on a weekend, what could I do if there were real resources to get this research done. Mm. And I think I'm not alone in feeling that way. There are a lot of people, a lot of scientists who've had a passion for this for a long time, who never had the resources to seriously pursue it. And now that that is happening, I think we're going to see a lot of important new discoveries, a lot of breakthroughs in our understanding of these substances. Because when you look at it, I mean, this Congratulations. is something that- it's Amazing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's, uh, it's kind of surreal yeah. um, you, when you think about it just how stigmatized this has been for so long to then suddenly oh, see it's please. really happening. There's, yeah. there's people that, whose full-time job is making new psychedelic drugs. Do you have a sense of sort of what you might find? Are you certain to see signals of things ahead? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that there's, there's, I think there's all sorts of things that people are looking for. You know, a lot of w one big research question is uh, not just the precise mechanism of certain therapeutic effects, but can they be uncoupled from the psychedelic, psychedelic effects in such a way that it might be possible for larger numbers of people to benefit? My suspicion mm. is that it will not be possible, but this is a, a question mm. that a lot of people are looking at. For me, uh, one of the things that interests me most is simply the possibility of discovering something unexpected. Because when you look at the history of medicine, uh, so right. many great discoveries have not been some kind of uh, directed hypothesis driven pursuit, no, but something that no. was discovered entirely accidentally, whether you're talking about, uh, Viagra or Rogaine penicillin. or, or penicillin or, uh, aspartame or, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of things were discovered, uh, accidentally. And that sort of thing is not uncommon in science. In fact, it's extremely common that you find something or Kevlar or anything like you're doing something and you think, yep. Um, 
that, oh, that's interesting. This chemical is sweet. And then you realize you've discovered a new artificial sweetener. And I've been seeing that in my own work, these totally unanticipated right. properties of certain things. And I think that just by virtue of this being an area that many people could not study until recently, the fact that more people are thinking about this more carefully and studying it right now means that it's inevitable that new and unexpected things will be discovered outside of the things that Very are expected, exciting. like uh, refinement of the therapeutic properties of the known psychedelics. Are we going to come up with a different nomenclature? I've always felt the nomenclature was just sort of primitive. What do you mean? Like what nomenclature specifically? Like just the, the, word whole, the calling something a psychedelic and versus not, and and it's just I I don't know. It just it's it's not uh, satisfying to me. It feels like it needs it needs to be a little more based on the chemistry, and I I don't know. I you know when we. <laughs> I, I, you know, we're, it's, I don't know many class. I mean, we you know we'll call something an antihypertensive, but the you know the class we have is an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. We have classes based on their chemistry, uh, with within the general category of antihypertensive, say. But no one's talking about that really. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, in that sense, I guess it's closer to something like an antidepressant, where you have a diverse array of pharmacologically and chemically different substances that are all related in this single uh, outcome of treating depression, right? You have uh, opioid antidepressants yeah, but, like TNAPTIN. Right. But again, but see the antidepressants, right? Well, how do we categorize them? Well, we have SSRIs, we have MAO inhibitors, we categorize them by their mechanism, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. So interesting. I just, just something I was wondering about. Yeah. But listen, I, hats off to you. God no, I agree. speed with your work. You go, Godspeed with your work, my friend, because I've been, I, I've been if just sort of, uh, you know, with with a, I, I've not been in this you know, with both feet. I've seen lots of things clinically. Uh, I've been an observer more than anything than an active participant, and I'm I'm with you. I, I get this feeling that something is really going to come out of this, and but in the meantime, we have to be really cautious and really careful about claims and. Who uses it and when? It's just like anything else, you know. It, it has great potential, uh, and hopefully, that will you and your whoever else you're working with will unlock that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very excited as well. And it's uh, are we drawing to a close here? We are drawing to a close. Anything else you want to say? Okay. Well, it's, well, no. It's, it's nice to talk, talk to you. It, 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 even though last time we spoke, it, evidently you were seven and a half or eight, uh, <laughs> and your parents didn't know it, and I'm and I apologize to them now uh, publicly. But uh, you turned out okay. That's good. We didn't hurt anything, <laughs> and that's always important. Hopefully, we helped even. <laughs> but uh, again, give us give them the PayPal and the website and everything where they should go. dot com slash Hamilton Morris to listen to my podcast, which is all about chemistry. PayPal. <laughs> My PayPal. Well, the, uh, you, he has a, it was a, what was that? The, what do you call it? The uh, Patreon, your Patreon. <laughs> yeah, Patreon. PayPal. Yeah. Patreon. <laughs> I don't know. About PayPal, like, Patreon. Patreon. Everyone knew what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about psychedelic chemistry, that's a place to do it. Yep. Beautiful. All right. All right. Hamilton Morris, yeah. thank you for spending a little time with us. Appreciate it so very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a pleasure. Talk to you later. Okay. Take care. Uh, Susan, you were saying what? Susan, Susan is uh, very excited about Hamilton's appearance isn't, today. Isn't Paulina a huge fan of his? Oh, I don't know. Remember that, when boss. we were going to book him before and she's like, oh my God. Oh yeah, she did say she wanted to hear what he had to say. Oh, I want to hear me talking God. to him. That's, that's true. Uh, be interesting. She might experience it a little differently think, from <laughs> no, this point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Uh, well, Hamilton, Morris, appreciate it. And, and what will happen, I'm going to predict The name him. just rang in my head. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I think will happen is him and his type will unlock some sort of a molecule that will get very, very specifically at some of the things that hallucinogens do that are specifically positive. Like some, some single targeted, you know, if it is the dissolution of self, that's a little too much. It's going to be some experience of that, some version of that, that, that leaves behind in particular the diminishment of the dread associated with end of life, things like that, or the diminishment of depression and suffering. There's going to be, there could be a lot of stuff that comes out of this because the, the, that whole all these different chemicals that clearly have massive effect on the brain have been just locked away. And now we'll slowly, you know, when, when this research starts to get done, it, they just get narrower and narrower and narrower and more and more specific in where they go and what they do. And, and, and they become safer typically as that happens. So 
We will say we will see. Um, it'll take years, though. Let's be fair. Margaret Campbell likes our painting. Oh, good, excellent. That's uh, at Henry Bunkle. Look it up. Let's see. Yeah, uh, CB. Uh, wait, let, let. I wish you could see more of it. Um, Jeremy saying we have more natural psychedelics inside our body that can be unlocked sober without any drugs. Um, yes. Uh, but again, the, you know, the things in our brain that are natural are receptor systems typically on the surface of cells and therefore can be, uh, stimulated or activated by other chemicals as well. I think that's what you're talking about. Uh, let's see what else you guys, please tell me, uh, you're going to, uh, say again, what Fauci said, uh, Midge, what he said today in an interview that I heard was that the, there's been a slight uptick in hospitalizations from Omicron in pediatric cases. And, and there, that was seen in South, America, South Africa as well. And that has been one of the areas of concern is that could this be something more significant for kids? And he specified very clearly today, he said the uptick is not due to Omicron because the kids that were being admitted are being admitted with Omicron, not because of Omicron, meaning they must have other serious medical conditions and they get Omicron and that makes it need makes increases oh. the probably of needing hospitalization. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. So it's not the Omicron per se They're getting not people going sick. In because they just and, got the virus. They and I can tell you something. Exactly. Uh, Aaron Carter, I've not had any contact with him. And in terms of Omicron, I'm I'm seeing just dozens and dozens of cases. And people that are vaccinated are doing extremely well with it. Uh, people that are not vaccinated, it's been a little hard for them. Uh, it's hard to tell between Delta and Omicron in the unvaccinated population. And um yeah, the I, I'm actually, I have to report on this. I am extremely disappointed that it has become increasingly difficult to get monoclonal antibodies, particularly in Orange County, California. They have like a shortage there. It's, it's frankly, I, I'm sort of disgusted slash mortified that that is the case. And where is the Paxlovid and where is the Molnupiravir? Where is the strikes back, Susan? Uh, the, the, the Molnupiravir and the Paxlovid would be... Oh, he's got it. Thank you. <laughs> Would be it. so helpful in this setting because if somebody is getting sick or hasn't been vaccinated, d might have Delta, Paxlovid would take care of it in a second and we can't get it. And I don't know what's wrong with our system that we can't distribute it. I've talked to wholesalers. I've talked to pharmacists. I cannot get those medications and it's disgusting to me. So uh, the gauntlet is down for those of you in pharmacology, in pharmacotherapeutics or in pharmacy distribution. Get on the case of these companies or the federal government. They're the ones that are hoarding it. Why they haven't distributed these things is disgusting. People are getting hurt because they're not distributing them. It could be really easily helped. We still have, we still have fluvoxamine. We still have decadron. Uh, for some patients, you know, we have, you know, uh, budesonide and, you know, we can do other things, but, but not nearly as powerful as the monoclonal antibodies and the Paxlovid. We need access to these things. All right. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are in New York this week. We are going to have a show tomorrow. What time, Susan? Sorry about the Wi-Fi thing. I have yeah. to go reset the router. Mm. I don't know why I did that. What time again tomorrow, do you think? Um, I think it's a... See, I think you need to get closer here. to that mic. I can't quite hear it's you. It's 5.30 here. So, so. 2.30 Pacific time. 5.30 Eastern, 2.30 Pacific. Yeah, we yeah. have a couple of guests, we hope. we got Mia St. John, who's a recovering person, a boxer. We don't have Kat. And we don't have her. No, unless we start at 5 and she leaves, maybe. Five. I don't know. Mia St. John. Okay, Hopefully maybe we'll Kat. We're, we're trying to talk Kat Tim to get in here. Maybe some clubhouse, clubhouse calls as well. And uh, Susan and Caleb, great our our, uh, our, know, we threw this our virginal voyage today. Yeah, you did not. So you don't realize you were out here for three hours working on this thing. You were out here for a long time, and, Maybe, and you yeah. you guys pulled it together very very well. And so yeah, here we are. The quality is good. Well, well, I unplugged the <laughs> Ethernet because we were plugging and unplugging, and I forgot to plug the Ethernet. Plug. Oh well, at least we know what happened. I know. So uh, that's uh, that. But our but, <laughs> but our so. Wi-Fi our Wi-Fi is weird. It like when I go to look stuff up it takes could you hear away. caleb he's like ah it takes a while hallelujah it, it eureka a while to land, to, well we don't we haven't been here for a while time. <laughs> no it wasn't your fault it, it wasn't right. your fault any of the time we got the mix minus fixed on our little instrument here <laughs> i know we have a new thing we, we bought yeah. a zoom pod, pod track p4 and we're trying that out for the first time so we could use our blue mics Fantastic. And the mic sounds great as always. It's, do I sound this, froggy like Drew now? Yeah, you do. I yeah, know, you do. Huh? But this blueberry is my favorite thing. It's ridiculous. I knew uh, you were going to. 
Well, I, I it's still possibly COVID. Another thing about it's Omicron is the testing is all over the place. There's some data that came out today that shows that I don't have COVID. the home tests are not good. If they're negative for Omicron, if they're positive, you have it. But they're not detecting a lot of the Omicron. And I'm going to tell you something I'm observing Just, that I bet's going like to come out. I bet's going to come out in the press later is that even with PCR, people have very narrow windows of viral productivity. I really think that's happening. I have like a 12 to 24 hour window in some people when you can detect this thing. And if you miss it, you just don't get it. And okay. And they're out of quarantine in five days and not producing virus. So that's appropriate. Uh, so everyone who's panicking about that, uh, about that five day thing, don't panic. It, when it, at least when it comes to Omicron. When it comes to Delta, I mean. I mean, I had a rough night last night. Mm. I, so did I Douglas. Sweaty and, uh, and yeah. achy and stuff. Yeah. But it wasn't any worse than going through menopause. So uh, COVID is like menopause. It what we're is. Saying you, here. you wake up tired. Sweating. Sweating and tired. But the only good thing about having something that they think is COVID, you get to sleep in. Yes. When you have menopause, they don't let you sleep in. They. They. That's a shot directly at her family. <laughs> so, okay. Well, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you all for being here. I see you guys on the restream. We thank you for they being around. They don't want to be around you. And tomorrow again, <laughs> it is 2.30 uh, Pacific, 5.30 Eastern. We might be as early as 5 Eastern, to 2 Pacific. The, the and we will router. get the e Ethernet uh, under control yeah, here. Yeah, it's so. pissing me off. I'm and Caleb, well done. We'll see you all tomorrow afternoon. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 800- 273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. I just wanted to ask a quick question. Do you ever notice how some people have butthole eyes? Like their eyes just look kind of like a butthole. What's up with that? Gentlemen, uh, sure have you ever have, seen butthole eyes? I have never seen butthole eyes. What the fuck does that what even mean? What are you talking about?